Hello and welcome to Back of the Net. So a new era at AFC Bournemouth begins and it begins with the appointment of Gary O'Neill who's become the next permanent manager of the Cherries. It's finally been confirmed on afcb.co.uk after a period of conjecture where numerous media sources including the Telegraph, Talk Sport and The Athletic and others all suggested that the Cherries interim manager was getting the job. In this video we'll gauge the social media reaction of the appointment and we'll be flashing a number of your tweets and comments on screen but before we begin whilst we can't speak on behalf of all AFC Bournemouth fans the initial feedback we got to say shows that every Cherries fan seems to be 100% behind Gary O'Neill he's a man that took a side that was mentally on the floor and he's given the players confidence and belief and as a result we now stand in a much healthier league position than I think we all expected so Gary thank you for what you've done we are all behind you but we've got to say, despite the unity in welcoming Gaz into the job, there has been a lot of scrutiny about how the decision itself was reached. And it comes after a period where Cherries fans have been almost licking their lips at some of the names that have been flying about, most notably Marcelo Bielsa. The former Leeds manager, he was seemingly out of our league, but with the press talking up the Argentinian's potential appointment at AFCB, plus with apparent meetings going on between the board and the manager, his arrival at Dean Court at one stage actually looked more than possible. However, with a combination of factors falling into place, including Gary O'Neill turning down the chance to interview at Luton Town, the writing, we gotta say, did seem on the wall. Then with the news, that the talks with Marcelo had broken down. O'Neill's incoming job role, well, it was effectively all but rubber stamped. It's fair to say that not many Cherries fans are overwhelmed. If there are any supporters in that camp, it's a small percentage. As for the rest of us, well, we're seemingly either underwhelmed or whelmed, if that's even a word. And that's not to discredit any of Gary's work, of course. We can, and we will, all get behind a man who has done so well for us in a short period of time. But once again, it's not the man himself that's under scrutiny, but it's the manner of the appointment which has really disappointed many a cherry. We feel for Gary a little bit. It's like being picked last in the playground. But why was he left to wait so long before the announcement? Was he ever our first choice? Well, our suspicion is that perhaps he wasn't. If the work he'd done was deemed sufficient for the job, surely, straight after the 3-0 over Everton, this should have been enough for us to have given him the role there and then. But no, just like on previous occasions, the appointment was a long and drawn out procedure whereby household names were being flung about in the media with Cherry's fans almost salivating over the prospect of a big name manager. Whilst it needs to be said, of course, that this was only media speculation, it seems that the board at Dean Court definitely did have designs on someone other than Gary. But once again, we find ourselves in a position whereby we've fallen back on the guy that we had already. I mean, wind back to 2020, Eddie Howe leaves, the club's linked with John Terry, Phil Neville, and there were even designs on Scott Parker. We end up with Tyndall. Fast forward to 2021, Tyndall sacked. The club are linked with Vieira, Henri, Wagner. We end up with Woodgate. And now in 2022, Parker sacked and the club are linked with Nutson, Bielsa, and we end up with O'Neill. Of course, we don't know exactly which of the aforementioned managers actually had conversations with the board, but once again, it is a frustration to Cherries fans that these names are even leaked, especially with the seemingly inevitable subsequent decision being to revert to the cheap option. It does seem to be a trend in recent seasons. And 18 months ago, we actually spoke to Mark McAdam and we asked him why and how top names are leaked. And I pondered whether, in hindsight, that the club might have wanted to not reveal said names because of the disappointment that failure in securing them would create. I think probably, like, like everything in football, um, in hindsight, everyone would do everything very differently. The same, you know, the same way that, you know, I would do stuff differently in hindsight over the course of the last few weeks, over the course of the last few years, my career and work and family and life, everyone makes decisions that they perhaps regret a little bit later on down the line. But you always make those decisions at the time uh, with the best interests. I genuinely feel like the club were trying to be open and transparent and honest uh, and, and, and perhaps they should have just shut up shop. You know, there are some football clubs that say absolutely nothing to the fans 
and the fans are left wondering what's going on with my football club. Some perhaps say too much um, and then lead you know, fans down down the, the garden path and, and they think the club's going in one direction and then suddenly they do something different and everyone's saying, well, you said this. Football is a moving feast uh, and nothing is ever certain, ever. Um, you know, and you look at some of the players that perhaps Bournemouth have signed over the years, you, you look at them and you think, well, that was a bad signing. But then you put yourselves in the, the shoes of those making the decision. You look at the list of the three or four players they could sign in that position and they go, well, you know, there's been times where I've looked at players that have joined Bournemouth and I thought, you know, why did you sign that player? And then you have a conversation and you go, well, these were the four options. And you go, well, oh, yeah, I can see why you signed him now because I would have taken him and I would have taken him and I definitely would have taken him. So there's always a thought process to hide behind every every decision. Uh, and I think the club perhaps just got caught out with, with being a little bit too honest, maybe, um, trying to do the right thing. Uh, and of course, you know, once you start this process of searching for a manager, it's n there's nothing simple in football. You know, there, there is no straightforward process where it's, this is the situation, it's all black and white, bomb, 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 and go. It, it, you know, there's always so many shades of grey that make this decision and this whole journey a really challenging one for anyone that, that has to make it. And I'm so glad that I'm not making this decision because I can imagine how difficult it is. Maybe as a club, we're just a little bit too transparent sometimes. Interestingly, some fans think that it's almost a weird social experiment that we're doing. If we go and have conversations with big names, regardless of the intention of employing them, the profile of the club is raised and it may make the ears of other potential candidates prick up as a result. Maybe it's just a clever way of making the club look bigger and more desirable than it actually is. Who knows? But look, alternatively, as is possibly the case, what happened is that the club did interview these names and they simply gave the role to who they considered was best for the job. In fans' minds, of course, once we have various names banded about in the media, what we do is natural. We create our own tier list in our heads about which names are the most exciting and best suited to the job. I mean, I'm guessing not many had Gary O'Neill over Bielsa in that tier list, right? Maybe a few did. But for the board, what they do is they draw up a list of pros and cons, I suppose. And then between Hughes, Blake, Foley and whoever else, a decision is made that secures the stability of the club. For us, midway through the season, with the club in a mm, perilous position in the league, the decision would undoubtedly be maybe more short-termist than long-term. And that'll be Foley's focus here, right? He's forking out a wedge of cash and he needs the club to be staying in the Premier League. They've analysed the two managers and they've either decided or been forced into a position whereby O'Neill is deemed the best. And certainly there are reasons why you could say that O'Neill's appointment is right. For instance, with Marcelo Bielsa, you would require a change in personnel, ball playing defenders, and you would effectively be ripping up the rule book, which most of our players are now fully ingrained in. He'd also be expensive. He'd be bringing in a different team and he'd want resources above and beyond what maybe AFC Bournemouth might be able to offer right now. He's a manager that also doesn't tend to join clubs mid-season and he takes months and months to get the players playing how he wants. We don't have months and months. Yes, his brand of football would be exciting and reckless, but... Is that the type of harem, scarum stuff we need right now? Plus, his tenures, like I said, they're, they're only ever short term. Look at his managerial history. He doesn't hang about. I thought the appointment of Parker was because of the yearning of uh, a name to oversee a long term project. And a plan which involves Bielsa is, well, not really that. Is that strategy changing with the board or did we ever have a strategy? With Gary O'Neill, yes, we are learning on the job, but he's managed to adapt very quickly. You could have called him naive at times, yeah, of course, but it must be remembered that the two times we've done that recently, one game was with the aid of a Travers flap at the hands of a Champions League side, and the other time we were coasting in a game and a worldie of a strike changed the fortunes of the opposition. Yes, of course, we had Saints and West Ham before that, but O'Neill seemed to learn from those poor showings, and... Look, despite the poor quality of the opposition in our last two games, by the way, of Everton, Cherries did show a really intelligent style of play, morphing effortlessly from 
a four at the back to a three within the back whenever it's suited, with Tavernier seemingly being the fulcrum. When he goes, we all go. And it worked to a T. Under O'Neill, we don't have to rip up the rule book, we don't have to change the way we play, and we don't necessarily need new personnel to fit a specific formula. What we will hopefully get, though, is new personnel to complement the formula that we've got. But the question does remain, of course, as to whether Gary will be able to attract the names we desire over a big name like Bielsa. O'Neill is the least risky option, and in the position we're in, I can see why we've gone down this road. The number at which we're sat at in the league table, it looks all right, but with the games ahead, it must be said that we could be likely to drop a few places if results don't go our way. At Newcastle, we were actually tremendous at the back, and in the first 60 against Spurs, we were pretty much flawless. Do we want to go all Bielsa Bournemouth against Chelsea and Man United? I'd suggest that perhaps we don't. Maybe, just maybe, Gary O'Neill actually fits the short-term ambitions better than what a supposed long-term appointment does. Naturally, fans obviously will feel as though a big appointment really would be a statement of intent for our immediate future, but perversely, maybe Foley is securing our long-term future by looking short-term. Either way, the new tenure, perhaps for some fans, is starting in underwhelming fashion. Actually, maybe the word underwhelming isn't the word we should use because we're saying that word because we're simply continuing as we were. Maybe that's not underwhelming. Maybe it is whelming, like I said. We have been delighted at the steadying of the ship and perhaps that's what the board have decided we need for this season. No mad changes, no reckless cash flashing and perhaps a time to get over the line this season and prepare for the next with a little more purpose and extravagance. Maybe, maybe that's the case. But once again, it's worth underlining that it's not necessarily the end result that Bournemouth fans dislike. O'Neill has developed his game in a short space of time and he could turn out to be a great manager. Whilst I'd stop short at comparing his skill set to someone like Eddie Howe, like others have, he seemingly does have all the attributes to be successful. Were we that bothered about Bielsa? Probably not. Football would have been exciting, but it would have been a risk. And the issue, though, is simply the way it's been played out once again. Like I said, maybe we've been too transparent and honest in revealing the names that we've been talking about, potentially. But it's the second time that that's happened. You could call it the third. You'd think we'd learn. Or maybe the board were just in conversations with Bielsa and sometimes, just sometimes, if you're out spotted chatting to a high profile manager, there's not a lot you can do to keep those kind of rumours quiet, is there? I suppose all we can do is trust the process. The appointment has been made and the decision, of course, it won't have been taken lightly. We've now got a caretaker manager in permanent charge. The board know it, Gary knows it and we know it. So what this episode has done is merely put more scrutiny on those at the helm of the football club. They will know the decision that they've made as maybe disappointed fans, but the strength in their own conviction means that they've had the belief and the confidence to see it through, knowing that any failure will reflect not on Gary O'Neill, but on themselves. They've taken a risk, but the safest risk. Now, of course, any board of any football club, it needs scrutiny, and AFC Bournemouth, they're no different. Largely, it has to be said that they've done well with transfer deals, but managerially, we've now had five different people in charge in just over two years. Not ideal. Then the history of Premier League caretaker manager stepping up, well, it isn't exactly littered with glory, but fingers crossed he bucks the trend. Gary, we are all behind you. We're looking forward to the return of football in December, and whether there are 10 of us or a thousand of us at St. James's Park, we cannot wait to be singing in the Leeses stand. We'll be singing your name and we'll be hoping to get through to the next round. Up the cherries. Come on, Gaz, you beauty.